Hello, and welcome to the Studio Q Show. My name is Quinn Jacobson, and I'm going to talk to you today about frequently asked questions. Uh, questions that I give, get over and over again. And I'm going to also address or read some of the questions that I have on the um, YouTube comment post here. So this this podcast is kind of a um, a general FAQ address some of the more basic things. I'll read the, a couple of the questions and uh, I'll expound on them and we'll, we'll talk about a few different things. Um, so the, the first one I'm going to address is from Ashley V. Um, she said, I think it's a she, I believe it's a she. Quinn, my first set of supplies for wet plate collodion onto Illumatypes is on its way to me. I'm starting out using a Holga to see how I like the process. Perhaps if you think of a few pieces of advice for newbies, you might address in an upcoming video. I'm also excited to have found you and I'm looking forward to following new videos. I joined the farm as well and have taken many notes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate that. And I think what you're, you're addressing here is... Uh, some advice for newbies and that's you know it's I know it's a broad question a very broad topic but I do there's a couple of really important pieces of information that I would tell anybody starting out in the process is be patient take your time don't get um, don't have that kind of 21st century mentality or mindset when it comes to this this will take you several weeks or several months or several years to really get down and really feel comfortable with. Some people are, are quicker than others. It depends on your resources. How much time do you have? How much money do you have? Um, those kinds of resources are incredible um, when it comes to how fast you can work through the process. But it takes everyone a lot of time. It just does. It's, it's the nature of the process. It's, um, you know, there's safety factors involved. There are quality issues. And there, are, there there's even conceptual issues if you want to go that far. So everything takes time. But probably my biggest piece of advice is to just slow down. Read as much literature as you can get your hands on. And, you know, again, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to plug my books here. The positive book and the negative book, this is, this is kind of a, this is a supplement to this one. But um, the, definitely the positive book for if you're just starting out, um, go, go snag that. I have um, an iPad book with about 20 some videos embedded in it. And there's videos online too. If you want to buy those, you can buy those and get access to those. Consume all that information, not just mine, every, everyone else's. Take it all in, take a look at it. Um, pay specific attention to the safety and the handling and the storage of chemistry. And the chemicals, the making, how, how you want to protect yourself uh, during the making of the chemistry. Those are really, really critical points. Um, so, so specifically, take your time with the process and be safe with the process. Those two things um, will produce um, good results. Number one, you'll be alive. And number two, you'll have, uh, um, you'll have some good photographs. And you'll learn a lot, too. The longer you take... The more you accommodate and assimilate that information, the, the better images you're going to have over time. So, um, yeah, time and safety, time and um, patience, definitely. So thank you for that, Ashley. If there's anything specific, you know, write me and I'll, I'll try to, to answer you specifically. Um, so here's one from Jan from the Czech Republic. Um, Natural light versus artificial light. Strobes, continuous light, how many wattage? Um, thanks in advance. Oh, this is, oh, he's following up. This is Boris from Switzerland. I am with Jan regarding my question to lighting. Of course, I know the benefit of natural light, but if it is not available, what would, what, what, what would you, your hint regarding artificial light? Strobes, continuous light, how many wattage, preferable brand? Thanks in advance, Boris. Yeah, so that's a good question. My preference is natural light, okay? And natural light means that I'm, I'm working in the 5500 
to 5600 degree Kelvin temperature, right, of white. So, and it's not, it's not the direct sunlight we're talking about. We're interested in the north, <clears throat> my OCD kicked in here a little bit, let me clean that off. We're talking about the north actinic blue light. This is where all the UV is. This is the light we're interested in with collodion. Um, this, this direct light and other things. We want <clears throat> north face open shade is the best light you can make collodion photographs in. And if you're using these old vintage lenses, the period lenses, like I do, um, it's really important that you even pay attention to which way your camera is faced. For instance, um, let's say you're going to know why I'm a photographer now when, after you see my illustrations here. Um, <clears throat> say you had an old lens here on your camera and the sun is up here. Now, I'm not saying this will happen every time. I'm saying it's a possibility, and I've had it happen. And your, your camera's kind of facing into the sun. Even though you have a great big gigantic flange on this lens, and like, like mine, what happened with mine, mine's an F2.5, my fastest lens, so it's a big chunk of glass. So I had my, lens, my camera kind of facing into the sun, and all it took is one little kind of stray piece of light to hit into that glass. It bounced around and fogged this plate, or actually put a light streak on the plate. Um, terrible, didn't work, just doesn't, doesn't happen. So you have to either shade it, put something over it, get you an umbrella, something to cover so if you're going to face into that light. And that's really not the best light anyway. You want to use that north um, open shade, north facing, really beautiful good light for collodion. That's that's what you want to use. And if you have access to a skylight studio, that's like shoot fish in a barrel. Shooting fish in a barrel, as we say in, in America. It's just really easy. Right there, the fish are in there. Boom. Or you stick your fishing pole in, catch one. That's just like what, what I'm talking about with photography in a skylight studio. If you have a skylight studio, you can't miss. It's too easy. Um, especially north facing, a good skylight studio. Um, you have that, a good lens, your image is, I mean, super. Simple, straightforward, and super. It's all about light, optics, and chemistry, right? Exposure and all that stuff, but really your basic setup. So natural light is the best. The other part of the question was, what do you recommend? Um, there's a company called Photodiox. Uh, let me write this so you can read it. Photo. Diox. I'll put a link down below too. I think that's what it is. Photodiox.com. They have continuous compact fluorescent light systems. I also use black light bulbs, BLBs as we call them. This black light bulb is really significant if you're doing portraits. It softens up. It Well, it doesn't soften up. It gives a better skin tone. Uh, doesn't blow out the skin so much. It's more natural looking to me. Uh, Photodiox, and I'll put a link to the specific kind of light system. You can build your own. I have a couple of banks here of black light bulbs and continuous fluorescent lights. Um, strobes. Yeah, you can use strobes, you know, like something like 4,800 watt seconds plus. Um, and you'll probably get, you know, you'll probably get with fresh collodion, you might get, you know, let's say at F4 or F5.6. You might get away with uh, one to two pops per image, something like that. Um, you know, people use them. I used them years and years ago. I never cared for it. I don't like the aesthetic. Um, it's too, uh, too artificial for me. I like the more natural um, wrapping light. You can you can get do that more closely with continuous um, light as well too, rather than the strobes. But it all works. You might want to take, remove your UV um, cover off your strobes if you're going to use strobes. And if you put any kind of diffuser or anything over those strobes, it's going to, it'll really cut your time uh, or increase your time. It'll cut your light down significantly. So pay attention to that. Yes, you can use anything. Look for the link in the bottom of this, and I'll show you some alternatives for continuous light. Um, 
com compact fluorescent light and, and black light. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, let's see. Brian Joseph, hi, Quinn. I'm really looking forward to your podcast. I've only been making plates for a few months and mostly thrilled only a couple hundred plates so far. But, of course, I'm always running into various issues. I'm interested in all the previous questions, and here's another one. I'd love to know more details about silver bath maintenance as well as testing silver gravity. Okay, so um, Brian Joseph from Los Angeles, go ahead and watch that silver nitrate video. You probably already watched it, but um, that'll answer your questions about those. Um, Craig from uh, Kansas, he writes, Great concept, very, will be very educational. Would it be possible to briefly discuss in a future podcast a darkroom design you prefer doing positive negatives. Yes, um, I will. I will go into some depth when I. I've got almost 200 square meters down here, almost 2,000 square feet. It's just raw open space right now. I'm using it as my dark room and my studio set up and different things. But when I get it tricked out the way I want it, varnishing room and printing rooms and all kinds of stuff like that, I'll I'll take you on a tour. It's probably going to be. Um, after summer this year um, and then some people ask about negatives and making and daguerreotypes and things like that and we'll try to we'll try to cover those in the future um, somebody uh, Walter Johnson just asked a few days ago about bottles uh, where do you get these bottles and I'm assuming he's, he's asking about these uh, these are Koran from the Koran company um, they're Roma recycled glass bottles. I have uh, various sizes. I have the pour and drain bottle for collodion. This is 125 mil, 250 mil, and a stock bottle for the big ones. And I even have, yeah, these these one liters you've seen these shot or shot glass uh, Duran uh, shot bottles made in Germany. And I even have two liter bottles. It, bottles can be very costly and they can get very expensive, but they're critically important. And I like glass. I just do. I like I like the glass bottles. So, um, the let's see what else, what other question do I have here? I was going to address another one. Um, we talked a little bit about um, yeah last time we did the varnishing, and we talked a little bit about the importance of um, varnishing. And one of the first questions up here that I saw, that I read, was from Mike, um, Mike Cullen from Brooklyn, New York. He says, question regarding varnishing. Is the varnishing step absolutely necessary? I asked because when I had my portrait shot at the photo booth in San Francisco, they only dried the plate and put it in a plastic cover. I haven't noticed any oxidation on the image over the year and a half I've had the photo, but then it's framed behind glass. Curious to know your thoughts. Thanks, Mike. Um, you're in Brooklyn. I mean, that's uh, that's going to be interesting to see how that holds up. It is absolutely critical that you varnish these images for the simple fact the photograph is basically made, the image portion of the uh, photograph is made of pure metallic silver. Same thing as your jewelry, your silverware, all those kinds of things. So with the sulfides in the air, over time, that silver is going to turn into silver sulfide. Silver sulfide is black, is dark. Um, silverware, you can take a tarnish cleaner and clean your silverware off, but you can't do anything like that with photographs. So really it depends on what area of the world you live in, how much pollution there is, and how you've um, addressed those sulfides hitting that plate. In your case, you've got it framed behind glass. A lot like the daguerreotypes, although we gild daguerreotypes, they're not really varnished. I mean, they're they're pretty much they're vulnerable, in other words. So you take a little piece of material, air, put a little air gap in there, put a plate on and seal it up, the daguerreotype, and frame it up or put it in a you know case, whatever you're going to do. Basically, you've done the same thing here. Um, it'll be interesting to see how long that lasts. It may last for a couple hundred years. Who knows? But if you if you are making photographs and selling photographs especially I think I said this in the last podcast you want to you want to make sure you're you're varnishing and varnishing properly 
with materials that we know that are safe and ar archival and um, because if you put photographs out there in the world and they're not they're not going to hold up that's that's not going to be very good so yes to your question mike absolutely necessary you should do it and i just made the video last week i'm sure you've probably watched that take a look at that that'll address your question in depth um and and those those issues so thanks mike cullen from brooklyn new york i appreciate that let's see if i can do one more here um we had on the silver nitrate bath i think i'm going to just pop in here real quick and take a look we had a couple of questions on that um let me see if i can find it uh yeah i was a vernon trent from dusseldorf germany what up vernon very nice to see you quinn very informative as always sometimes i was afraid you'd get some drops of silver flying into your eyes um yeah i i appreciate that i i hear you and i should wear goggles messing around with silver nitrate um basically spilling silver nitrate in your eyes or having it splash in your eyes is not a good thing it will blind you uh, my concern is more about the bubbles popping and i try to avoid that and uh, but i should i should wear goggles you're right um barney melton hi quinn i have 30 grams of silver nitrate am i correct in thinking that 30 grams is enough to only make 330 mils at nine percent you are correct also what when you make up one liter, how much of that one liter goes into your tank for the plates? That's a really good question. Um, so, Barney, the, the, the idea here is, so when you make a liter of silver nitrate and you're only making quarter plates or four by five images and your silver bath tank is a very small one, maybe a half liter, um, you want to fill your tank up half liter a whole liter my tanks are liter tanks generally speaking i do have some half liter tanks and i have a six liter tank as well too for my 1620 stuff but i fill the tanks completely full and i uh, no matter what size of plate i'm making in that specific tank and i'll tell you why that silver bath needs to do a little dance with the collodion and maybe that's a, a really good podcast for the future as well too talking about how these um, these three critical elements, the silver bath, the collodion, the developer, have to play together really well um, to make good solid images. So as that silver bath gets used to being um, introduced over and over again to a specific collodion mixture, um, the better it's going to perform, the better you're going to, the better result, the more stable it's going to be, the better results you're going to have. So if I were just to pour half of it in, and just do four by five plates or whatever and then reintroduce it into the larger quantity or the other half of the, the silver bath you sometimes not always you can run into some problems with that not always it's just best to, to be consistent to use the quantities to introduce all that silver to all the alcohol to all the ether to the collodion to the iodides let it let it work with that collodion in the full capacity um, you can you can also um, think of it as the uh, you know yeah ba basically that's what it is as you make plates every plate that that you put in your silver bath tank is going to add and take away from that silver bath it's going to add solvents of course it's going to add some nitrates in there and these byproducts from this little dance it does this metathesis or this double decomposition de double decomposition and as they exchange this information and the ammonium iodide turns into silver iodide and the cadmium bromide turns into silver bromide. You want all that consistent throughout um, your baths, the life of your bath, the maintenance. I keep a very strict kind of protocol going just for the simple fact I don't want to be messing around with chemistry all the time. I want to be making photographs. So um, that's why I use the full liter or your half liter, whatever your tank holds, make that amount and use it. Even though you're, you may not, I fill a liter tank up, I might only be making half plates. It doesn't matter. Use that liter, expose it, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that answers your question, Barney. Then we also um, we have some interesting questions. Um, 
Let me see if I can find, or at least one interesting question. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, but I have, oh, here's one. Bonze, mm, I don't want to say your last name because I'll, I'll butcher it. C-H-A-L-H-A-L-A. -H -A -L -H -A -L -A. Chalahala. Hello, this is a great video. Thanks for it. Now my process is getting better, but I have one question. What if the bath is more acidic than pH 3? Do we have to add water and silver, or is there any other way? P.S. What happens to the plate if the pH is more basic or more acidic? Thank you. Good question, Bonze. I think that's how you say your name. I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, and he doesn't say where he's from, but Anything for making positive images, anything from pH 2 to pH 4 is great. Negatives um, tend to like a little more basic bath. Um, you leave them in a little bit longer, the uptake of the silver nitrate. You're trying to maximize the, the density of that plate or the maximum amount of free silver you can get on that plate. I've never seen a pH lower than 2.5 or so, 2, 2.5. If, you're, if your silver bath is that acidic, you're talking uh, pH numbers in the range of sulfuric acid or nitric acid, something like that. So I've never seen that. What would happen to a plate that went into that? I don't really know. I, I'm, I'm unsure. I've never seen it. Um, a plate over five and a half, six, uh, your, your, your image probably won't form. It, it won't um, the, um, be too basic. Um, so I say, I've never seen a bath with pH lower than, than pH 2, like I just said. Baths, are, baths that are more basic, say pH 5 or so, are good for making what clodian negatives. If your baths are, e are on either extreme, you'd want to use bicarbonate or acid, respectively. Most of the time it will be around pH 3 or 4. So it's all about the uptake of silver. The part of parts of hydrogen or the power of hydrogen is all about how that silver nitrate interacts with the the uh, salts, the halogen, or the formation of halogens in the collodion. And the, the pH, the par power parts of hydrogen, or power of hydrogen, um, plays a role in the uptake of that silver. So our magic number, like I said, for positives, two to four, and a little more basic if you want to make negatives, but that's for another time. <clears throat> uh, Anthony Furman, I think is his name. This is a great video. It's consolidating a lot of my knowledge. One suggestion, could you please kill the music in the background? <laughs> yeah, we did that. Oh, and one question regarding the silver bath. How do you clean your silver bath tank? Christian Clant. Uh, I don't know where Christian is from, but uh, I don't clean silver bath tanks. I, uh, the most I'll do is flush them out with some distilled water and let them air dry. Typically, and maybe sometimes I'll take a clean paper towel down in there with a dipper and maybe clean the sides out or something like that if I have something on it. Typically, you don't need to. I mean, it's used for silver nitrate bath, and if that's the only thing going into it, and you can rinse them out with distilled water, but never use anything, never use any cleaners. I wouldn't even use tap water on it, to be honest with you. Um, some things are better left alone, and that's one of them. So... You can, yeah, you can use clean paper towels and the dipper to clean the walls if you want to or need to, but rinse them out with distilled water, something like that. Um, and there's some random questions here. Let's see, or comments. Um, opposite to what cross your mind? Oh, no. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about the, uh, some of the, the, the concepts or the philosophies about people. I got a really nice email yesterday. I, I should, you know what, I'm going to read it to you. And I'll only use her first name because I haven't asked her if I can read this or not in public or on the air, but I hope she's okay with it. Um, she's very um, open. And, and every once in a while, I'll get these. I'll get, and what a, what a wonderful thing to open your email. I get a ton of email. But um, usually it's all technical and it's all, you know, about the stuff we're talking about in these videos. But check this out. I'm just going to use her first name. Her first name is Jessica. And thank you, Jessica. If you're watching this, this is very kind. And probably every three or four months, I'll get something almost identical to this. I mean, verbatim, almost word for word. Um, Quinn, 
message here. Quinn, I just started reading chemical pictures right there, right? And am so moved by your writing. I feel like the introduction has been written to me personally. You've captured everything that I've been feeling lately about digital image making. I grew up in a dark room, and now after nine years of working digitally, I want to put my cameras and phone down and go back to making something real. There you go. After a year of making tintypes on my iPhone, I am doing a tutorial with Jen Jansen here in Chicago, and we are going to make tintypes with a Hasselblad and 4x5. Awesome. That'll be fun. That's great. I am, also, I, I am so excited. I would love to meet you sometime and maybe do one of your workshops. You're welcome anytime. Anytime. Your work is stunning, and I'm hoping to finish your book by Wednesday. I'm hoping that I can embrace wet collodion and join the wonderful community of photographers who work in these process. Thank, processes. Thank you for the gift of your beautiful work and writing, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. That's those emails make my day simply for the fact that really at the end of the day we're not talking about technical issues we're not talking about um, what kind of material your material you're making photographs on or how large your camera is or any of those kinds of things what we're talking about is more about the philosophy the purpose the the intent the reasons we're making photographs that those are really really far more important to me than the technical. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like getting in your car and just driving and not having any destination. Um, where are you going? I don't know. I'm just driving. It's just fun to drive. I, I, I get that. I understand that. But if you read like Jessica did in the uh, first chapter of my book, I go on kind of a little rant about my philosophy about what art is, how it should be used, or how how good art is used or how good art is made and why it's made and the purpose and intent behind it, the context to it, what's around it, why is this image made, what, what are the intentions around making that image, why are you using collodion, why are you using 35 millimeter color film, why are you using 4 by 5 sheet film, why, 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 why are you making those choices? And you can say the same thing about why did you compose an image that way? Why did you light it that way? Why did you pick the format size you picked? I mean, everything, everything for me has a reason. It's not just random. It's not just because I saw it somewhere. I understand influence is incessant. I get it. I understand that. But at the same time, there needs to be very conscious, deliberate decisions in um, your choices. And if you're just emulating or mimicking someone or something, that's what it is. You're mimicking someone or something. If you're just doing it uh, to be kind of a techno hobbyist, is to be a to be play with things and have gadgets and chemistry and you know toys and all that. That that's fine too. I mean, but the, the photographs are why I work in these processes. Why I choose to work in these processes. The reason behind them. Um, are really important to me. Um, there was a gentleman, oh, I need to find this. There was a gentleman from Australia that wrote, and let me, let me pull his comment up here if I can find it real quick. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he said that in the first intro here, and I just, I was just coming back to revisit that. Hold on just one second here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I used to do this um, um, audio podcast, so you didn't let, have to look at my ugly mug. And uh, I did I did talk about um, philosophical and conceptual issues quite a bit then. Let me see if it's on here. Yeah, Michael Schubert. I should have remembered your name, Michael. Good day, mate. Yeah, yeah I hope you have a good one. I don't know what time it is in Australia right now, but uh, let's just say it's during the day. Hey, Quinn, congratulations on this initiative uh, from Michael from Australia. Maybe you could revisit the podcast on slow photography. That's what I was thinking about. Um, I particularly enjoy your aesthetic insights as they make me question my own. I remember reading something about what is, what is not photography by you. 
All the best with the new videos, home studio, and genre. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you were the same um, guy that wrote me about um, when I was doing my um, audio podcast. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's I think it's the I think you're the same person. Um, and thank you for that. I appreciate that. And that's what I'm kind of talking about is is the reasons. And I'd like to I'd like to reiterate uh, and revisit that just for a minute. The reasons why, I want to give you one example anyway, the reasons why I use the wet collodion process. And I want to refer to the um, two projects specifically that I've done. I've made three major bodies of work. Portraits from Madison Avenue, uh, Glass Memories, or Fergangenheis Bewildigung, the um, struggling to come to terms with the past, the, the European work, the Germany work, and... Uh, um, um, the American West portraits. It didn't slip my mind. I was just trying to think if the the portraits from Madison Avenue and the German the Ur European work was showed together in a show at Santorin in Paris, the gallery in Paris, um, as a work called Glass Memories. There were 88 um, images in that, and a lot of them were diptychs and triptychs. So there was over I think 115 plates, original plates in that show. So it was a large show. It was two bodies of work. I want to address those two bodies of work real quick. Um, <clears throat> if you read my statement, and it's not a bunch of artsy fartsy stuff, it's I really try to be honest about my feelings and and try to be authentic about what I'm doing. My statement addresses this process informing or supporting my work, and I think you've heard me talk about in the past my work, my tripod, my little uh, here's my tripod, memory, identity, and difference. Those uh, keep me stable. Memory, identity, and difference. And I'd throw a, a fourth one in there, justice. I'm, I'm a big believer in and I'm compelled toward making work that um, questions social or political or even moral issues sometimes. I, not, I don't want to go too far that way. But so, so my main concern, memory, identity, and difference. So the Portraits of Madison Avenue work it was all about the memories I had Growing up, uh, with, my father owned these low-income apartment complexes, and going to those complexes and being exposed to these very unique, um, marginalized people, amputees, drug addicts, um, uh, just, you know, ex-cons. So Portraits of Madison Avenue was about the ideas, the questions, the concerns, if you will, uh, I had about the difference in my community versus their community. And so my point is, conceptual, conceptually speaking, is that I, I, the, one of the first things I picked this process, the wet collodion process, to work in, uh, one of the first reasons or the first big one that came to me was that it, this was an abandoned process and the people that I photographed were abandoned as well too. The fragility of the glass plate, the glass I'm working with, the fragility of the people. You could even say the danger of the chemistry and the danger of the people. or Those kinds of concepts kind of tie in. Um, but the, probably the one of the strongest ones that really uh, dawned on me after making photographs for quite a while. I worked on that project for almost four or five years, probably five years close to it. Um, was the kind of the imperfection in this type of photography and the imperfection in the in in our own human nature including mine and theirs mine the whole imperfect nature of this process was appealing to me up to that point um even film was su is super clean and digital is 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 perfect i mean beyond perfect so there was a real connection there for me working with these forgotten, abandoned people and working in this process that kind of echoes their imperfection and fragility and all of those things that kind of surround that community. And then when I moved to Europe and I started working on the um, that, that project in Europe, uh, it started out as Kristallnacht. The, I was photographing synagogue sites where the great synagogues once stood, as large and small, all through Europe, specifically Germany. And 
Kristallnacht was about the night of broken glass, and I was working with glass, and I was using, and still am using, the potassium cyanide for fix. That's the very um, Zyklone B, the very chemical they used in the gas chambers to murder people. So those connections came quickly. So all this, this process talk always supports my intent or content of the work. It's never, it's never just kind of random. Like I said, it's never just um, put out there because it's cool or whatever it might be. There's always reasons for using it. And that's kind of what um, Michael was addressing here. This kind of um, revisiting or or reexamining the um, idea of of the use of photography and what is photography, and um, I'm not really sure I know. Um, I don't really know if there's a, a good explanation for it. I it's not that I'm um, it's not that I'm anti digital. It's not that I'm anti film. It's none of that. Um, and, and there are great ways to utilize and use all that. I, I cross process constantly, um, going from wet collodion to, um, silver gelatin paper, um, to uh, digital prints, to digitizing images. And I, I mean, it's, I'm all over the spectrum with that. So it has nothing to do with that. It's, it's more the conceptual, the idea behind that and what that means to question that, to, um, to think about these ideas as um, conceptual problems, if you will, and and how we're identifying or how we're defining what photography is, how it's used, why it's used, those kinds of things. So I'm I'm constantly encouraging people to get out there and and have a reason, have context and intention behind the work, have um, have a very well thought through, um, researched. Um, project in mind, if you will. And, you know, when I go to a photo gallery or an art gallery and I see photographs or whatever on the wall and there's no context to it, there's no, there's nothing written about it. The artist or photographer has really nothing to say about it. I'm, I'm, I'm the type of guy that just says, well, I'm not going to do their intellectual work. I'm not going to try to figure out what they're trying to do. It's that to me isn't, you know, isn't, I want to know the intention I want to know what the artist is thinking or the photographer, why they made those choices. And it has to communicate to me that way. I mean, that's, that's a, that's an important part for me. And I'm, I'm not saying it has to be an essay or a documentary story at all. I, I do, I don't work in documentary. I don't, um, I would say nothing about my photographs are true. There's nothing true about, um, there may be some truth with a capital T in some of my photographs, but there's surely nothing that's going to end up in a, in a newspaper. I worked for newspapers for many years. I was a ph photojournalist for many years. I know that game. That's not what I'm playing now. Um, this is a completely different thing. This is a personal endeavor. I'm just saying academically, intellectually, conceptually, um, I think your work, I think photographs need to have this strong connection and tie in put kind of kind of sew a thread back through history and art history, photo history, and kind of connect all those pieces together with your project or your ideas to kind of communicate this full package of what the potential of a photograph might be or a photographic project might be. And I've always been more interested in working in projects as a whole rather than individual photographs. Um, Kind of like in the old days when I worked as a photojournalist, you'd have a feature story photo, kind of one standalone image, and then you could do documentary essay stories, you know, in depth. So, and then coming up to my most recent project, the one that I've been working on for the last 12 or 15, 16 months now, uh, the Native American Massacre Project, the um, Ghost Dance Project. This is one that I'm super, super excited about um, and super nervous about as well too for for a couple of reasons first it's a very delicate sensitive topic that needs to be um addressed in a in a way that's uh non-exploitative not that, that, that doesn't exploit you know there's a fine line between exploration and exploitation and this is these are all areas that really slippery slopes that you can get hung up and uh, slide down those slopes if you're not careful. So I've been really pacing myself through this and 
making the right connections and doing, I hope, the right things. And, and we'll see how it turns out. But my concept or my thoughts and ideas behind this, this project, the, the Ghost Dance project, is, is not unlike the previous three projects. This, this is supported not only by my own heritage, but by where I, where I grew up, my concerns with, um, uh, I threw that fourth word in there, justice, my concerns with how we, um, especially in the Western United States now, how we're looking at this, this specific problem, um, addressing places like Sand Creek, the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado, Wounded Knee, the Pine Ridge, um, South Dakota uh, Pine Ridge Re Reservation, uh, third world countries. I mean, just it, it's really difficult to make landscape photographs in a 19th century process. And, and I'm making them big. I'm doing 16 by 20 inches, 40 by 50 centimeters. Um, it's really difficult to convey the emotion and the power and the problems I'm not saying I have any answers to these problems, but the, the problems of the Indians, of the first peoples, the, the, the first nations, the, the tribes, the, the Native Americans, um, those issues specifically in these, the, around these massacre sites. Um, it's, um, it's difficult. It's a difficult project, and it's, um, it's taken a lot more emotional and intellectual power than any photographic process power for sure um, and we'll see how that turns out but the reasons behind I've, I, I'm selecting this pro process to, to even do that project in is first of all it was used during that time period the great Indian Wars as, as we call them here in the West um, that was the heyday of wet collodion um, this is the process that Native Americans or Indians um, feared having their portrait made in because they felt like it, it, it took a piece of them away, their soul. And thirdly, I'm, I'm playing on the very people that were involved in the, the taking of the land, the, the, um, the, the photographers of the 19th century, the, the big landscape photographers, you know, William Henry Jackson, Timothy O'Sullivan, Gardner, all those, all those wonderful photographers that made these Watkins that made all these great large images of landscapes of the West. I'm kind of playing on that as well a little bit too. But these aren't; these may be beautiful landscapes, but but the psychology of the land and the space, all those things um, play into it. And and so when you see this big, beautiful 16 by 20 landscape of Sand Creek or Wounded Knee or um, Skull Valley or uh, Carbon County, wherever it might be, um, Cold Cold Gulch, Cold Creek Gulch, wherever it might be, uh, your your visceral reaction, your immediate reaction is, oh, that's that's beautiful. You walk up to it, and you look at it, and then you start reading about it. And you read that you know 270 men, women, and children were slaughtered here, and their body parts were taken back into Denver and paraded along Larimer Street and ended up in the Apollo Hotel on display. Those kinds of things, it changes the dynamic. That information changes the image dramatically. Um, and um, I'm going to keep my computer awake here for a second. Um, so for me, concept and context and intention is as important as how many salts are in this collodion and how do you filter your silver what do you do mix this chemistry or that what about this exposure or that lens this plate holder and that camera i mean that's all fine and dandy but i i think it's uh it's more about at the end of the day it's more about what you're saying about the images you're making uh the, the message or the idea that you're conveying is it is it something that's um is it something that's important and worthwhile to do? And that's for you to, to decide. I, no one can decide that for anyone. But the, the conceptual part is incredibly important to me. So I appreciate Michael's uh, comment and or question. So we can, we can delve into that some more, too, at a later date if we want. Just let me know. Give me some feedback, guys. Let me know uh, what you want to do, where you want to go. I have a couple of things on the docket for... Um, a couple of podcasts in the future, the technical stuff, but, but let me know, let me know what you think. 
uh, where we want to pursue. I was thinking about maybe doing a technical and then a conceptual, a technical, then a conceptual, and kind of swapping them out. So we have a variety, not just technical, not just uh, mixing chemistry or resolving problems. So if that's appealing to you, let me know. Um, I'm going to close it up because I think that's enough for today. Um, I'm going to wrap this one up. Um, like I said, give me your feedback. Let me know what you think. I appreciate your time. Have a great day and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.